بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم ربنا لك الحمد والشكر كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك اللهم إنا نعوذ بك منك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته إن شاء الله يبقى يزقود إن شاء الله أما الحمد لله So uh, not last Friday, the Friday before we finished uh, with uh, the story of the marriage of Ali radiallahu anhu and Fatima radiallahu anha. And this marriage to Fatima radiallahu anha uh, happened after the battle of Badr. And we have seen how the how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the Sahaba Kiram the companions, radiyallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with them, uh, were triumphant. They were successful and victorious in the Battle of Badr, despite the fact that their numbers were uh, much less than the numbers of the Mushrikeen at the time. And we saw how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the night before the battle, uh, the battle uh, was begging Allah Azza wa Jalla and crying before Allah Ta'ala for victory. And how the, during the battle, the angels السلام, came and assisted the army. Uh, 70 of the mushrikeen were killed and about 70 were taken as hostages. Prisoners of war who were, who were treated fairly and many of them were ransomed themselves or were freed anyway. And then we saw the beautiful story of Ali when he was a bit hesitant to go and ask for the hand of Fatima he was shy but then he married Fatima and the marriage was very simple the mahr was very very small Rasulullah said whatever you have give he said I don't have anything he says, even the shield, remember the shield that you have? He says, but that shield even is torn out. Torn out. He says, you just give that as mahr. And he married Fatima radiallahu anha, Sayyidatu Nisai Ahl al-Jannah. She is the master of the women of paradise, who died six months after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So just as the Sahaba went back to Medina victorious and before the dust settled, in the third year of Hijrah, remember Badr happened in the second year of after Hijrah, and now in the third year after Hijrah, another major battle is about to begin. In this case, the Mushrikeen, when, when, they, went, when they went back to Mecca, they were psychologically damaged, physically destroyed, because the anticipation was that a strong, one th- a 1,000 strong army would obliterate a 313 ill-equipped army of Rasulullah but the opposite happened. So psychologically they were traumatized which made them also very very angry and very upset and so they began to prepare to come back and fight Rasulullah and their reasoning was if we don't completely destroyed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and this new emerging victorious group of Muslims then we will never be able to stop them and so the mushrikeen went and prepared a thousand, an army of 3000 an army of 3000 men and women and we will see the numbers of this army but there were four main reasons why the Qurayshis, why the people of Mecca or the Mushrikeen, the disbelievers of Mecca, wanted to come back or wanted to fight in the Battle of Uhud. Number one, there was a dini reason, instead of dini, a religious reason. And the religious reason was the, the fact that the battle between haqq, truth, and baqil, falsehood, will remain till the day of judgment. 
And Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala tells us in the Quran that in the kafaru yunfiquna amwalahu liyasuddu an sabilillah that those who disbelieve will spend their wealth to stop the deen of Allah. They will, they will do whatever it takes to stop the deen of Allah because this is the battle since the creation of Adam. When Allah Ta'ala created Adam, قَالَ إِنِّي جَعْلٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً And Allah said to the angels, I shall make a khalifa on earth. قَالُوا أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَا يُفْسِلُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ The angels said, you will create a khalifa who will commit corruption on earth and will shed blood. وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ And we glorify your name and your, uh, Ya Allah. He said, إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ I know what you don't know. Uh, and then when Allah Ta'ala asked the angels to, to make sujood, usjudu li Adam, fasajadu illa Iblis. They all prostrated except Iblis, Shaytan. He disbelieved and Shaytan uh, thought he's better than Adam. Qulna hbitu minha. Then Allah Ta'ala says to both of them, both of you descend from here and go to earth. You shall be enemies of each other till the day of Qiyamah. Granted, there is no escape from it. There is no escape from the fact that Shaytan, Shaytan is your open enemy. Then take him as an enemy. But the challenge with fighting shaitan is that you don't see shaitan. And a physical enemy that's in front of you, you could fight. And perhaps the similitude or the example of the absence of shaitan, the, the fact that you don't see such shaitan, you're fighting a battle against some thing, some being that you don't see, which is more difficult. And it reminds me of what Ibn Khaldun said, Rahmatullah Ali, in a 14th century scholar who is considered today as the father of sociology. Ibn Khaldun wrote one of his most important books called Al Muqaddimah. And until today, they are studying his Muqaddimah, scholars from the West and the East. And they're finding that Ibn Khaldun, for example, was the first historian to write a, 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 the history of the world based on reasons for rise and fall. And he was the first, based on observations that he has seen, he spoke about the cyclical, uh, or the fact that sometimes you will rise and sometimes you will fall, regardless of what civilization it is. But he also said something interesting. He says, the he said, uh, fighting a physical enemy is easier than fighting an enemy that you don't see. And then he drew that, he, then he came to the conclusion and said, that is why physical occupation, physical occupation, is easier to fight and resist than intellectual, cultural occupation. When you're occupied culturally or intellectually, as is happening today in today's world. The West, America, Americanization particularly, has occupied most, in fact, all of the world intellectually and culturally. And it's harder to fight that than if they were right in front of you as a physical army. Intellectual occupation is worse and harder than physical occupation. That's why the only way to fight intellectual and physical, intellectual occupation is through knowledge and ideas. Anyway, so shaitan is an enemy that is unseen and the only way to fight shaitan is through obeying, obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following the sunnah of Rasulullah Full stop. You can't fight shaitan with machine guns and, and weapons and armies. For example, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, when you leave your house, if you say, Bismillahi tawakaltu ala Allah wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, then the shaitan that's waiting for you outside leaves you alone. 
and the angels will be with you and the angel will say and wa 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 you are guided you are protected and you are sufficed and shaitan leaves you alone simple dua sunnah simple dua but look at the power of that dua that's how you fight shaitan you eat food you say bismillah shaitan does not eat with you and becomes weaker that's why I say, they say, say, you can make your shaitan strong or weak. You, through your actions. And when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once said to Aisha عنها, when he came back home late, it's typical, right? Usually, and the, the wife says, you know, where have you been? You know, the jealousy comes in. And she, and she said, were you in the other house? He says, why are you jealous? Did shaitan come to you? Did sh your shaitan come? She said, why do I have a shaitan with me? She said, everybody has a shaitan, he said. She said, even you, Rasulullah, he said, even me, walakin shaitani aslam. He says, but my shaitan submitted. Aslam became a Muslim. <coughs> Hadith Sahih. And the ulama interpret this in one, two ways. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, but my shaitan, qareem, everybody has a qareem. He says, my shaitan submitted. The ulama say he actually became Muslim or he became so weak that he could no longer inspire evil to Rasulullah And, and this, that's how you fight shaitan. You fight shaitan through ita'atillah, obeying Allah and his Rasul. And shaitan is weak. But the battle between Haqq and Batil continues on the day of Qiyamah and so Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says Inna ladina kafaru, those who disbelieve yunfiquna amwalahum liyasuddu an sabirillah to, to prevent and stop people from the path of Allah فَسَيُنْفِقُونَ ثُمَّ تَكُونُ تَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسْرًا They will spend all of their money but they will regret ثُمَّ يُغْلَبُونَ And then they will be defeated because this is the, this is the somebody beautifully said in, in, the, in, in, in the history of Islam and Islamic civilization and the future of the history of Islam, the story always ends in a good way. The story of the Prophet ﷺ, if you read the Quran, despite all the challenges, it always ends in a good way. We don't have uh, our, the, our histories and stories from the Islamic narrative never end with a tragedy. It always ends with success. That's the promise of Allah. Nuh alayhi salam, Yusuf alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Despite all the challenges and the fight between Haqq and Batil, the end is always good. The end, and see what the Ummah is going through now? The end will be good for the Ummah. No doubt. And Allah Ta'ala said that. Sayyid Fiqurah, they will spend all their money, all their talent, all their energy to stop the deen of Allah and they will not be able to stop the deen of Allah Taala. The second reason the people of Mecca, the Quraysh and the Mushrikeen wanted to fight Rasulullah Zami was Ishtimali. It was a social reason. Why? Because they lost their prestige and status after the defeat in Badr. Because many, if you remember some of these, they call them Saladid uh, Quraysh, the, the heads of the chiefs of the clans were killed in Badr. And you know, if you've always felt that you are the best and you are somebody special and you are the chief and you are it, and then you are defeated, and that's what happened to the Meccans of Quraysh, they wanted to reinstate, reinstate their social standing. And they felt the only way we can do that is if we defeat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the third reason, of course, was economic. There was a reason, economic reason, because they realized that if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions, who are now dominating in Medina, they could easily stop our trade routes. And we can't allow that. And, uh, of course, uh, there was also a political reason. And so this is the nature of usually struggles. It is either for one of those reasons. 
Today we have a bigger struggle as Muslims and I think it's the, the battle of ideas. The battle of ideas. That's why it's wrong sometimes uh, uh, to think that uh, uh, practicing deen and doing everything that Allah Ta'ala tells us but sit, sit and do nothing in terms of dunya and that everything, it doesn't work like that. The Muslims in the past never understood it this way. They always excelled in everything they did. And the battle of ideas, they faced that in the Islamic civilization when they encountered the Greeks and the Romans and the Persians. And we spoke about this some time ago. And now we have this battle of ideas. And also today, the, the mechanism for propagating those ideas are much more powerful, the mechanisms, the media, in all of its shapes and forms, is so powerful in the way they propagate their ideas that if you're unable to counteract that, you'll find that it's easy to lose that battle. And you see in the last years, few years, not even centuries, the last few years only how a few ideas which in the past everybody used to feel this is completely unacceptable at a social level. Today it is, it is seen as not only acceptable, but whether you like it or not, you must also accept it. Battle of ideas. So Rasulullah he knew about the coming of this army from Mecca. How? Through his uncle Abbas. Abbas, if you remember, had accepted Islam. And he wanted to stay with Rasulullah in Medina, but Rasulullah said to him, stay in Mecca, that is better. And what Abbas used to do, عنه, is he used to send information to Rasulullah And in this case, he sent Rasulullah information that, uh, that an army of 3,000. He says, in Quraysh al-Qad ajma'at al-Masira ilayk. He sent him a letter. Quraysh has already decided to send an army against you. And therefore, you need to be cautious. وَقَدْ تَوَجَّهُوا إِلَيْكَ وَهُمْ ثَلَاثَةَ آلَافَ And he, they have come to you with 3,000. And they have 200 horses. And they have 700 shields. And they have 3,000 camels. He gave him exact details. And this time, what also the, 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 this army of Quraysh did was they took their women with them because they went with the conviction they will win and essentially also says, our women are with us, we cannot be defeated. We have to defend the women. And they brought their drums and their food and their water and their wine and they Absolutely ready. Rasulullah of course received this, received this letter from uh, Abbas عنه, and he knew the matter is very serious. So what does he do? What did he train? For? He, he, he trained his Sahaba عنه, and he made them get used to a particular style of leadership from Rasulullah And this style of leadership of Rasulullah was consultative, shura leadership type, consultative. Despite the fact that Allah Ta'ala sends wahi to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he Alayhi Salatu Wasallam in day-to-day -day affairs, in day-to-day -day affairs, he would consult so much with the Sahaba عنه, that Abu Huraira عنه, says, I have never seen anyone engage in mashwara and consultation like I have been Sahaba. And there's a whole surah in the Quran about shura, the importance of shura, which has become unfortunately neglected. So what Rasulullah did when he received the news that a 3,000 strong men, army of men is coming towards him, he, the first thing he did is he collected the Sahaba. And he said to them, Ashiru alayya, tell me what do you think we should do? 
There were two choices. The opinion of Rasulullah was we should stay in Medina and let them come to us. Let them come to us and we fight them in Medina. Here we are in a better position. It was his opinion. It wasn't a wahi. It wasn't a divine revelation. It was an opinion. The opinion was his opinion was we stay here. If they decide the army decides to stay outside of Medina and take their sweet time, we will wait for them. But if they come to us, at least here we are amongst our people and our family and we have our houses, we are better protected, we can fight from here. But there was another group of Sahaba, primarily the younger ones. And especially those, you know, the young people, you know, they're, mashallah, they're, they're full of, uh, which is good, I mean, they're full of that energy. They just want to, sometimes the emotions overtake their rationality. And that's why the, the ulama say, you need the vitality and the energy of the young and the wisdom of the old. Both are needed in order to, to do what you need to do, right? <laughs> because the young people have the energy and the vitality and they just want to do and they just want. And so the young of, among the Sahaba, especially those who did not take part in Badr, they said, we missed out on Badr. That we missed out on Badr. And we should go there and fight them. Leave Medina. We should go and leave Medina. And there was a discussion. And that's, that's a beauty, subhanAllah. I find, you know, that's 1,400 years ago plus 1,444 years ago. Rasulullah has this approach with the Sahaba. Now you know, and I know, if Rasulullah said, no, this is what we're going to do. What do you think they will do? If he said, we are going, he didn't say, we will go. He said, what do you think we should do? And he said, I, he said, I think we should stay here. The other person who agreed with him was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul the head of the Munafiqeen, the chief of the hypocrites. But most of the Sahaba, as we said, especially the young and the ones who really felt it was a genuine, it was a genuine feeling, genuine opinion. We missed out on battle. We want to be, we want to be out there. Most of them gave that decision. فَلَمْ يَزَلِ النَّاسِ بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ And so they continue, those people continue to express their view. No, we should go. No, we should go. No, we should go. حَتَّى دَخَلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ فِي بَيْتِهِ He listened. And Rasul Sallam was, very, as you know, very calm, collected, in control of his emotions. He listened to everybody, and when he saw that most of the people were saying to him, we should leave Medina and go and fight them outside. He went inside his room, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he was in his house, other Sahaba who noticed that they were too much, they were insisting too much on Rasulullah they came and started blaming him. And they said, the Rasul, they said, how Rasulullah arada alaykum bi amr. He presented his opinion and you presented your opinion, but you had to be very insistent. But Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi never ever blamed them, never ever saw that as a fault, never ever came back and said, It was because of you. So Hamza, radiyallahu anhu, the uncle of Rasulullah, whom Rasulullah loves so much. And Hamza is Hamza. Asad, the lion of Allah and his messenger. Hamza goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
فقال يا نبي الله او بروفيت اوف الله ان القوم تلاوموا the people when you went inside they were started blaming one another but we are happy to go with your opinion by that time rasulullah sallam had already worn his war armor because he accepted their opinion that we will go out we will go out of medina and fight so he went back in his house put his warm war, war armor on and that's when hamza comes inside hamza radiyallahu anhu says ya rasulullah i think we we can convince everybody to stay with, with in medina rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says it is not worthy it's impossible for an abi after putting his war armor on to take it off that's it it's two things and be alayhi wasallam never do to take to take off a war war uh, armor after they place it on and to turn their back in a battlefield they never turn their backs in the battlefield that's why the sahaba says in the ma'raka in the battle ila hamiya al-watis when the going got tough in the ma'raka in the battle this is the sahaba says when the going got tough we all hid behind rasulullah sallallahu and you see this when in the battle of uh, hunayn in the battle of hunayn is the only battle where the number of the mushrikeen was huge 10000 against a, a smaller number of the believers and in the battle of hunayn the rasulullah sallam and the sahaba were attacked by surprise because the person who was supposed to be guarding dozed off imagine 10000 angry <laughs> army coming to complete law literacy and and they came st- straight after fajr after sunrise and the, everybody was asleep and then suddenly they wake up and so many of them broke to uh, run away except rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam facing 10000 so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says to them that's it we go we're going and and this is interesting because rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam trained his sahaba and they said he trained them and he that you must express your opinion don't hold back don't hold back when it comes to the matters of community when it comes to matters of deen everybody has a share and everybody's view is is important because we don't know where khair is we don't know fa nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam awadahu hatta walaw khalafat ra'yahu he taught them that you express your opinion especially in matters of not, of course if it's wahi there is no opinion for anybody even rasulullah says there's no opinion if it's revelation there is no ra'y no opinion but everything else he used to say ashiru alayya tell me what you think completely contrary to the type of leadership that we see in muslim world today and even if the opinion that they gave was contrary to the opinion of rasulullah sallallahu because rasulullah sallallahu when he used to ask them he genuinely wanted to give them the opportunity to express their ideas and if as you said if it wasn't if it was not wahi then rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would allow them to take part in decision making give us your opinion and he would take his opinion sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this is from the nature of rasul sallam his rahma his merciful nature is that he was commanded by allah tabaraka ta'ala to consult 
And it's, it's surprising, therefore, when we find now in Muslim households there is no consultation. When a man, for example, thinks, no, everything I say must go. This was never the style of Rasulullah. It was always consultative. And wherever there is shura, wherever there is consultation, there is barakah. Because Allah Ta'ala told His Nabi Sallallahu the translation, the meaning, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ It is because of the mercy of Allah that you, O Muhammad وسلم, have been made lenient, gentle towards them. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّلْ غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ And had you been obnoxious, harsh, hard-hearted in your approach with, with your companions, your best students, then even they would run away from you. I want you to imagine this. Think about this carefully. Rasulullah the best teacher, the Sahaba, the best students, they would die for him. Allah is saying to his Rasulullah if you were hard-hearted and harsh and obnoxious with the Sahaba, they won't handle it. And nowadays we think that if we are hard and hard-hearted and harsh in our households or with our friends or with our students, then they're going to stick around. And when Allah says to his Rasul if you were like this, of course he wasn't, then they would disperse from around you. And then he tells him what he should do instead. Pardon them. Pardon them was them and seek Allah's forgiveness for them. It means pardon them if they do something wrong towards you, pardon them. And if they do something wrong towards Allah, ask Allah to forgive them. And in despite the fact that they may have these shortcomings, or shall continue to consult with them. Regardless, continue to consult with them. And this is one of the most beautiful uh, qualities of leadership that Rasulullah taught, which unfortunately, as we said, uh, is not present uh, in, many, in many leaders today. <clears throat> and, but in leadership studies, they say uh, this is one of the best forms of leadership. There's two types of leaders. They call it servant leadership, Sayyid Qam Kharimun, servant leadership. And the other one is a consultative leadership when you are when you consult and they say this is the best form of leadership in companies nowadays you know if you have a company or a school or whatever consult in fact it's interesting uh, because <coughs> uh, uh, one of the best ways to advance any company or in this case schools. We work uh, through our center of the university, we work with a lot of schools, Islamic schools. And often <clears throat> schools, like companies, when they come up with their vision statement and mission statement, they don't do so through consultation with the stakeholders, all stakeholders. So for example, Islamic schools, when they develop a vision or a mission, they don't consult with parents and students. The student is the main client, right? The student is the main person in the school and their parents by extension. So we often advise schools that the best way to advance a school and by extension a company or any organization or even your own house is to consult all stakeholders and ask them, what do you think we should do? How do you think we should do it? Genuinely. And if you want the best example for who did that, where well, here you go. Rasulullah And despite the fact that those young Sahaba who felt, you know, Josh, you know, is that what they say in Urdu? Josh? means, you know, 
They thought that Ahmad Yala get that right? Yeah, inshallah, I don't know. You know, they felt, and he knew it's better to stay in Medina, but he, he went along. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam decided to go out, he called what today they call Hal Tawarat, you know, state of emergency. That's it. It's on. You want to go out, we'll go. And he made he asked everybody to be ready. And that night he wanted everybody to be on their guard. He had chosen fifty of the best warriors to guard the Medina that night, just in case. And he also asked everybody to sleep with their weapons next to them. The people who studied uh, and wrote on uh, military leadership, they said Rasulullah was a brilliant military strategist. If anyone read the book by Michael Hart on the 100 most influential people, I think that's what the title is called. He put number, Muhammad Sallallahu number one. And in his, in his introduction, he says many people will find, will, may not like that. He's not Muslim, Michael Hart. I think he's even of Jewish background. And he wanted to write uh, the names of 100, the most influential people in the history of mankind. And by influence, he said, those who have the greatest influence on people in every aspect of their lives. And then he decided, Muhammad Sallallahu Allah says, and we shall elevate your name. And he says, uh, you know, and you can imagine the, the battle that he was going through intellectually, this man, because Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is everything opposite to what the West like, you know, to, 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 to think about him. So he put him as number one. And of one of the reasons, uh, he said, one of, one, of the, one, of, one of the qualities, he said, of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was that he's a brilliant military strategist. And in this case, if you think about it, the battle hasn't started. And the army of 3,000 is not even close. But he says, everybody sleep with your weapons next to you. Why do you think he's doing that? Psychological. The war started here. It's psychological preparation. You get ready. And now they are. And so when the other thing that Rasulullah did, when they decided to go to the site of Badr, uh, I beg your pardon, the site of Uhud, and anyone who's been to Medina, you see Uhud is not far from al Masjid al Nabawi. If you were to walk, it'll take you half an hour, maybe 40 minutes. And by bus, it's about five, ten minutes, ten minutes probably. When he left Medina, he left after midnight. He said, everybody, I want you ready. And he took a thousand strong army, still a thousand, is a third of the army of the, and he left after midnight. For two reasons. One, it's quieter. And the chances that the other, the army, the incoming army, would be resting is quite high. They're coming from Mecca, remember. Mecca to Medina is 500 kilometers. If you were to, on, on horseback, if you were to run all the time on the horse, it would take you three, four days. If you have an army of 3,000, you'll be walking slower and you'll get tired quicker. And if you're tired through the travel, you would have to sleep at night. And so the likelihood that most of the army was sleeping midnight is quite high. And so Rasulullah was always a step ahead. And he took them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he wanted a shortcut to, 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 to Uhud. But the only way to get to Uhud through a shortcut was to go through the farm of a non-Muslim, a mushrik, whose name was Mirba bin Qayri. 
And when Rasulullah went through that far with his army, Mirba, who was a blind man, he was physically blind, uh, noticed and could hear that this army is coming through his farm. He was very upset, of course, because he was against Muhammad and his army, so much so it says he took a, a dust, a handful of dust. And though he was blind, he was saying, show me Muhammad so I can throw it on his face, in his face. Billah. And he says, uh, I don't allow you to come through here. And so the Sahaba, when they heard this blind old man speaking so badly towards Rasulullah they naturally, what do you think they said? And those are the same young guys, right, who said, we want to go and fight. <laughs> young man. See, he sees this blind man speaking like this to about Rasulullah. What do you think they said? Let us kill him. Let us kill him. He says, No, leave him. لا تقتلوا فهذا الأعمى أعمى القلب أعمى البصر. He says, Don't kill him because this man is not only physically blind; his heart is also blind. And he went through that farm, and from that incident, it's amazing our scholars, how they look at these stories and they don't let anything pass. Because under no normal circumstances, you can't trespass to a, a person's private property. Right? But this is war situation. And Rasulullah wanted to have the upper hand, and he wanted to be, go to Uhud before the army, the enemy come, and so he needed a shortcut. So the, the scholars of Sirah and others, who, when they look at this story, they talk about now al-maslah al-amma wa maslah al khassa In Sharia, in Fiqh, there is the concept of maslaha. Maslaha, public interest, or interest. And there is two things. One is individual private interest and the public interest. And the question is, when does the individual interest takes preference over public interest? And when does public interest takes preference over individual interest? And the, briefly, not to, to take too much on this, the general uh, ruling of the scholars is that if it's to do with deen and matters of community, the ummah and the society and the community, then al-maslah al amma then public interest takes preference over individual interest. In other words, when you want to make decisions and decision making, you put your personal interest aside and look at the public interest when it comes to deen and that which is best for people. And I would, I would also add and say that even in matters of da'wah, in matters of da'wah, we should always try to put, we should always, not try, we should always put the best interest of the public ahead of our own individual interests. And that's why some ulama say when you sit and do mashwa, when you sit and do consultation, and when you give your opinion, when the, you're asked about giving, give, give us your opinion, subhanAllah, time flies, right? When they are, I always say, when you sit, like say you're sitting in the masjid to decide on an opinion to relate it to the community, to the masjid, or to deen. They said, be, be very careful when you give your opinion that it is not to serve your interest, your nafs. Be very careful that when you give your opinion, you don't put your best interest ahead of the interest of the community or the deen of Allah, which is very fine line. Right? A very fine line. And many a times, this is where people fail. 
This is where in the communities or masajid or organizations fail when they decide to put their best interest or their individual best interest over the best interest of the community. And that's why I say, if for example tomorrow Brother Arif wants to decide with a group of brothers to go, you know we have a great idea and we want to build a masjid, as an idea. And therefore I'm going to get collections from the community. The very fact that you are taking money from the community, you should be inclusive in their decision making, in the decision making. And don't put your personal interest and your personal ideas as to where the masjid should be or if even the masjid is the right thing that the community needs now. If you are going to put your hand in the community's pocket, then don't, don't make that decision for the community. You must consult the people of the community as best as you can. Why, don't, why is it that big organizations, when they want to do something, they do focus groups with community? Have you ever, ever seen... I haven't. If you have, let me tell me. Have you ever seen in our community, if somebody says, you know, we have a great idea, we want to build a masjid, or we want to have this, this brilliant idea for the community, but before doing so, let's have focus groups. And let's get our ideas. Let's speak to the sisters. Let's speak to the brothers. Let's speak to the youngsters. Get their ideas. He said, you know what, brothers and sisters, if tomorrow we collect $2 million, what do you think is the best project for the community? As opposed to, as opposed to, I will collect $2 million from you and I will decide what to do with it. Because I think having such and such is better for the community. And because of this approach, you find in some states in Australia, you find this is a fact, every next project is the same as the previous project. And millions of dollars are collected. I just came from a particular state of Australia <clears throat> and I was told by some of the locals in one night they collected five million dollars. The, the, the community is generous. They collected five million dollars to build something that already exists around every corner. So this principle, I should stop shouldn't I? This principle is so important. That's why we said when we do the seerah, we don't want to just tell stories. Al-maslaha al-amma fawq al-maslaha al-khassa The best interest of the community is above and beyond our own personal interest. And if Allah Ta'ala gives you a gives you a responsibility of leadership in the community. If you, are, you say you represent the community in whichever way you form, then you'd rather, you better, you better be inclusive in seeking the opinions of the community. And this is what Rasulullah Wasallam taught us. Before reaching Mac, before I'll finish with this, just before arriving at Uhud, Imagine the situation now. A thousand Sahaba going to a very serious battle against 3,000. They know 3,000, but they, all, all they could gather is a thousand people. And just before they reached Uhud, in a place called Ashawt, Abdullah bin Salul the one who said we should stay in Medina also. Before they reach Uhud, they didn't get to Uhud yet. Before they reach Uhud, he took a third of the army and left. Can you imagine the situation? Already everybody's tense. Already everybody is on their nerves. And his excuse He listened to the youngsters and not to us. 
That's exactly what لَقَدْ سَمِعَ لِلْوِلْدَانِ He called him Wildan. Wildan in Arabic means the children. He meaning Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Listen to the children. They told him, I said, I said we stay in Medina. But they said to go out. Number one, that's excuse number one. Excuse number two, he said, I don't think we're going to fight the Mushriki. There will be no battle. Ah, this is all talk. We're not going to fight. A third of the army. They are the worst munafiqeen ever. Can you imagine the, the, the psychological impact that would have on an, an army that is already a third in its size to the incoming army? A third. Not only this, Banu Salama and Banu Haritha, the two tribes of Salama and the two tribes of Haritha, when they saw a third of the army left, they went back, withdrew from the battle. From, not, the battle hasn't even started. Banu Haritha and Banu Salama also felt, well, if they're leaving, we're leaving. But Allah wa ta'ala gave them firmness to stay, the better Umar. And that's interesting because Allah knew the hearts of those 300 people that there is nifaq. And He said, I don't need them because they will bring nothing but weakness to the army of Rasulullah. But Banu Salama and Banu Haritha, there is iman in their heart. But it's human nature to be shaken when you see that others have withdrawn. So Allah wa ta'ala tells us, he's, he's, He reveals ayat to explain to us why this happened. أَن تَفْشَلَا طَائِفَتَانِ اللي بَنُ سَلَمَ وَبَنُ حَالِثَ Allah says, and when there were two groups, بَنُ سَلَمَ and بَنُ طَائِفَ were about to fail. They were about to fail, meaning to withdraw. وَاللَّهُ وَلِيُّهُمَا But Allah is their wali. Allah continued, Allah gave the films and they stayed back. They stayed back and forth. Inshallah ta'ala, we will continue next Jum'ah, bi-ithnillah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad s.a.w. wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha wa ta'ala s.a.w. wa ta'ala s.a.w. It's Adhan, no?